I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare, Series 2, Podcast M, Macbeth. Motivated by ambition, Macbeth and Lady Macbeth represent the masculine and feminine versions of the human choice to go against one's own nature and the moral law. In Shakespeare, the word ambition implies not merely the aim to improve oneself or one's circumstances. It is a negative term implying a desire to step above one's rightful place in the hierarchy of the state and of the world. I discussed these hierarchies in Session 1 of Chapter 7 in Series 1. Hence, the Macbeth's ambition itself is unnatural and immoral, and if not checked, will lead inevitably to unnatural and immoral acts. In Hamlet, Claudius confesses his motive for killing the king to be my crown, mine own ambition, and my queen, none of which rightfully belongs to him. It is the same with Macbeth and his wife. Their bad motive, named at Act 1, Scene 7, Line 27, vaulting ambition, is to step above their proper place, to be monarchs in the place of the rightful king, Duncan, and his rightful heir, Malcolm. Their evil motive is then pursued with evil means, namely the killing of the king. That act constitutes a violent attack, not only on the man, but on the order of human society and the order of the universe that it reflects as Macbeth himself recognizes in Act 1, Scene 7, lines 12 to 16. He's here in double trust. First, as I am his kinsman and his subject, strong both against the deed, then as his host, who should against his murderer shut the door, not bear the knife myself. In addition, Duncan has been a good king. Hence, killing Duncan goes against human nature, universal hierarchy, moral law, societal stability, and personal conscience. Lady Macbeth's version of vaulting ambition, expressed at Act 1, Scene 5, Line 70, as her desire for solely sovereign sway and masterdom, impels her at Lines 40 to 44 to call for her feminine compassion to be turned not merely to masculine strength, but to cruelty. Come, you spirits, that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here, and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. Stop up the access and passage to remorse. These masculine and feminine versions of the same choice are not caused by the prophecies of the weird sisters, who have the power to tempt, but not to destroy as we see in the matter of the unfortunate sailor, which I'll discuss a bit later in Key Line 1. The witch's prophecies to Macbeth form a temptation to which Macbeth and Lady Macbeth might have responded with patience and humility, as we know from the response of Banquo to the prophecy about him. At Act 1, Scene 3, Lines 123 to 126, Banquo recognizes the appearance of the weird sisters as a possible temptation of the devil. Oftentimes, to win us to our harm, the instruments of darkness tell us truths, win us with honest trifles, to betray us in deepest consequence. Then, in Act 2, Scene 1, lines 25 to 29, Banquo explicitly renounces the use of evil means to achieve the desirable end. Macbeth if you shall cleave to my consent when tis, it shall make honor for you. Banquo. So I lose none in seeking to augment it, but still keep my bosom franchised and allegiance clear, I shall be counseled. Despite Banquo's example, Macbeth and his wife, tempted by the witch's promise of kingship, make the evil choice in Act I and act on it at the start of Act Two. The rest of the play depicts the consequences of that choice and that action. The consequences include horror among all who witness the discovery of the murder, 
escape to safety by the king's rightful heirs, Act 2, Scene 3, Lines 135 and following. Inversions in the order of the natural universe, including owl screams and cricket cries, Act 2, Scene 2, Line 15, Storm, Act 2, Scene 3, Lines 54 to 63, and in Act 2, Scene 4, Darkness at Noon, Lines 5 to 10, as at the death of Jesus, as described in the Gospel of Mark, at chapter 15, verse 33, an attack on a falcon by a small mousing owl, lines 12 to 13, and the disobedience of the king's horses and their attempt to devour one another, lines 14 to 18. To these are added the additional murders committed by Macbeth in order to secure his position, and Ross's later description of the chaos and suffering of all Scotland Act 4, Scene 3, Lines 164 to 176. These chaotic consequences are accompanied by two other movements, one external and one internal. In the outer world, in response to the disorder, all the forces of good gather and rise up to expel Macbeth and his wife from the kingdom and from the natural and human worlds. The good Macduff having convinced the rightful heir of his loyalty, joins him in mounting a counterattack against the tyrant. The blessed King Edward the Confessor of England sends an army to support them. The trees of Burnham Wood offer disguising branches. Decent men, previously afraid to do so, leave Macbeth to fight on the side of the right. The sword arm of Macduff acts for all these forces when Macduff finally defeats and kills Macbeth. While this external reversal is developing, there is also a decay taking place within the souls of Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, a decay made visible to us through their words and actions and the words of others. As the tide turns, we are given a vivid image at Act 5, Scene 2, Lines 20 to 22, of Macbeth's condition. Now does he feel his title hang loose about him like a giant's robe upon a dwarfish thief. This speech and Macbeth's condition recall the damned tailor in the porter's imaginary hell, which I will discuss in a few moments in Key Line 7. The ambition of Macbeth and his wife drives them to betray truth, duty, virtue, justice, and order and by means of equivocation, hypocrisy, murder, theft, and cruelty, they achieve an illusory external success. But it is at the cost of their souls. Though salvation was certainly open to them, as Shakespeare and his audience believed, it could come only with true repentance. However, both Macbeth and Lady Macbeth repeatedly and resolutely choose not to repent but rather to confirm themselves in sin. Though at Act 2, Scene 2, Line 64, she has cynically said, A little water clears us of this deed, Lady Macbeth is condemned by her own guilt to relive the night of the murder and its horror over and over. No amount of imaginary water, let alone real water, clearing her of anything, until she kills herself in despair as we hear at Act 5, Scene 9, lines 36 to 37. Macbeth, even in the face of defeat, decides it is better to kill others than to kill himself. He says at Act 5, Scene 8, lines 1 to 3, Why should I play the Roman fool and die on mine own sword? Whiles I see lives, the gashes do better upon them. Having chosen to murder Duncan, Macbeth has thereby murdered his own capacity for peaceful sleep, as he reports to us in Act 2, Scene 2, lines 32 to 40. In the great and terrifying tomorrow speech of Act 5, Scene 5, lines 19 to 28, Macbeth reveals himself to be in complete despair, not only of life, but of all its possible meaning. The fitting and inevitable end of a man who has warred against every value that gives meaning to life. The honor, love, obedience, troops of friends he despairs of at Act 5, Scene 3, Line 25. 
Macbeth's conclusion in Act 5, Scene 5, lines 26 to 28, that life's a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing, not only depicts the utter despair that inevitably leads to damnation in the afterlife. It reveals that Macbeth, like his lady, is already in hell even before he dies. His soul is now nothing but the awareness of the eternal agony of meaninglessness. Lady Macbeth's sleepwalking nightmare and Macbeth's despair together present Shakespeare's most explicit evocation of the meaning of damnation. Hell is not merely a place to which one is sent for punishment, but the eternal condition of the self-damning soul. Finally, the play illustrates the structure of reality. The difference between evil and good is not arbitrary. It is built in to the nature of the universe and the nature of man. That structure makes it impossible to enjoy any promised good that is pursued with evil. The play thus illustrates the implication of the question in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verse 36, For what shall it profit a man, though he should win the whole world, if he lose his soul? Macbeth has said, at Act 3, Scene 4, lines 134 to 135, For mine own good all causes shall give way. Acting on that principle, he discovers that what he thought his own good could not be enjoyed when divorced from the good of the whole. Seeking his own good alone, in fact, turns his good to evil and then to nothingness. By evil means, he gets what he thought he wanted and finds that, like the witch's prophecies, it is not what it promised to be. Not because kingship itself is nothing, but because, betraying all value, Macbeth has made a nothingness of himself. Let's look in more detail at nine key lines of the play. Key line one. In Act One, Scene Three, lines four to twenty-five, the first witch describes a sailor whom she intends to torment. Importantly, she concludes her verse with, Though his bark cannot be lost, yet it shall be tempest-tossed. That is, she does not have the power to destroy the sailor, she has only the power to raise a tempest that will toss him about. The implication is that the witches cannot determine life and death. That determination is God's alone. They can test and tempt men, but not destroy them. The power to ruin a human soul lies only in the soul's own free will. This line has crucial implications for the play. Macbeth and Lady Macbeth cannot be damned by the intentions or prophecies of the evil supernatural powers, but only by their own free will choices to ally themselves with those powers. The evil witches turn out to be external representations of the soul's own capacity to be tempted to choose evil. Key line two. In Act One, Scene Three, lines 149 to 150, Macbeth begins his career of lying by saying, My dull brain was wrought with things forgotten, when in fact, as we know from his soliloquy, he was thinking about the hypothetical future rather than the past. This lie begins the descent that ends in despair, death, and damnation. Key line 3. Macbeth's soliloquy at Act 1, Scene 7, Lines 1 to 28, lists all the reasons for not killing Duncan and the inevitable reaction of horror that will come from doing so. He recognizes the evil of his intention and confesses his motive to be nothing but ambition. I'll discuss the challenging syntax of this speech in a moment in specific note 4. Key line 4. The Thane of Cawdor is a crucial foil for Macbeth. First, there is the powerful foreshadowing rhyme at Act 1, Scene 2, Line 64 to 65. Go pronounce his present death, and with his former title, greet Macbeth. 
Then, in Act One, Scene Four, Lines Five to Seven, we discover how Cawdor died. Very frankly, he confessed his treasons, implored your highness pardon, and set forth a deep repentance. As soon as we are told this, Duncan says, There's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. He was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. At which precise moment, ironically, Macbeth enters. Now Macbeth is the thane of Cawdor. On him, too, Duncan will build an absolute trust, again misreading the mind behind the face, and Macbeth will prove an even more significant traitor than the former Cawdor. It is left to Duncan's son Malcolm to discover the art to find the mind's construction in the face, and we will see him do just that when he tests Macduff at Act 4, Scene 3, Lines 1 to 137. I'll discuss that scene in a moment in specific note 10. At the end, Macbeth will resolutely persist in his battle against the good, and, in contrast to the former Cawdor, will die unrepentant and in despair. Key Line 5 both Lady Macbeth and Macbeth call upon nature to keep their murder secret. Macbeth does so at Act 1, Scene 4, lines 50 to 51, and Act 2, Scene 1, lines 56 to 60, and Lady Macbeth at Act 1, Scene 5, lines 50 to 54. Macbeth Stars, hide your fires, let not light see my black and deep desires. Lady Macbeth Come, thick night, and pall thee in the dunnest smoke of hell, that my keen knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry, Hold, hold. Macbeth Thou sure and firm-set earth, hear not my steps which way they walk, for fear the very stones prate of my whereabout, and take the present horror from the time, which now suits with it. Macbeth's line, take the present horror from the time which now suits with it, means simply that he wants nothing to prevent this horrible murder from happening at this most opportune moment for it to happen. Macbeth and Lady Macbeth are two versions of one evil mind, asking the natural world to go against itself and to serve them in what they well know are unnatural and selfish aims. It is significant that both of them get exactly what they ask for. The night of the murder is dark and stormy, and nothing gives Macbeth away before the deed is done. But though they get what they thought they wanted, they soon find out that they have killed all the good that it can do them by having killed the good in themselves. Compare this to the prophecies of the witches and to Macbeth's demands of the ghost in the banquet scene, which I'll discuss in a moment in Key Line 9. Key Line 6 In Act 2, Scene 1, Lines 63-64, to 64, Macbeth's resolution in setting off to kill Duncan is expressed in slow and calm rhyming. Hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. But once the murder is done, in Act 2, Scene 2, lines 14 to 18, the language of the dialogue between Macbeth and his wife is violently disjointed and chaotic. I have done the deed. Didst thou not hear a noise? I heard the owls scream and the crickets cry. Did you not speak? When? Now? As I descended? I. Hark, who lies in the second chamber? Donalbane. This is a sorry sight. The sight is Macbeth's own bloody hands. The act of killing the king has exploded the illusion of a safe and tranquil usurpation with happy results, the trammeled-up consequence and success Macbeth imagined at Act 1, Scene 7, Lines 1-4. to four. And now chaos governs both in Macbeth's mind and in the world. Compare this alteration from calm to chaotic rhetoric with that in Act 5, Scene 2 of Othello. Key Line 7 
Though the porter's speech in Act II, Scene 3, Lines 1-21, to offers what some like to call comic relief, relaxation of emotional tension and preparation for greater emotional intensity, it also provides significant thematic intensification. The knocking at the gate that began in the previous scene, at Act Two, Scene Two, Line 54, continues. Coming in to answer that knocking, the porter pretends to be busy welcoming imaginary souls into an imaginary hell, giving us three examples. Example A. The porter's imaginary farmer, having invested everything in the hope that a bad crop year would drive up prices to his profit, finds that a bumper crop has ruined his expectations. He had hoped to gain from the suffering of others. Their benefit and his loss drive him to suicide and damnation. Example B. An equivocator is a man who, arrested for heretical beliefs and treasonous plots, swears to an apparent loyalty in ambiguous language that he intends to mean one thing to the authorities and another to God. The porter's imaginary equivocator has fooled the authorities, but he couldn't fool God. This theme of equivocation is developed throughout the play. All the witch's prophecies are equivocal, seeming to mean something attractive, but turning out to mean something ironically quite different. Macbeth himself has prophesied his own fate by saying, at Act 4, Scene 1, Line 139, Damned be all those that trust them, that is, the witches. Too late he begins to doubt the equivocation of the fiend that lies like truth, Act 5, Scene 5, Lines 42 to 43, and too late comes his resolution at Act 5, Scene 8, Lines 19 to 22, and be these juggling fiends no more believed that palter with us in a double sense, that keep the word of promise to our ear and break it to our hope. With the damned farmer and the damned equivocator, we then have example C, a tailor. A tailor in Shakespeare's day would be given money to buy fabric with which to make the clothes he sells. The porter's imaginary tailor has been caught skimping on the fabric in making the clothes so he can profit from the stolen portions. English hose were loose so that without discovery one could use less fabric than was paid for. French hose were tight-fitting so that the habitual theft of the English tailor in making them would be easily discovered. The porter ends his list with, What are you? to imply, perhaps looking at the audience, for what sins am I welcoming you to hell? Each of the crimes mentioned by the porter applies metaphorically to Macbeth. Like the farmer, he has founded his own self-aggrandizement on the sufferings of others. Like the equivocator, he has pretended to loyalty while in fact being a traitor. And, like the tailor, he is a thief, stealing the kingdom from its rightful owner. For this reason, the last line of the speech, I pray you remember the porter, bears a triple significance. The porter is putting out his hand for a tip from Macduff. He is pointedly warning the audience members about the fate in store for any sinners among them. And he is instructing us to keep the thematic significance of his three damned souls in mind as the story of Macbeth unfolds. Key Line 8 In Act 3, Scene 2, Lines 19-26, to Macbeth, who has envied Duncan for his kingship and killed him to take his place, now expresses no less envy of Duncan for his peace in death. Macbeth muses, Better be with the dead, whom we, to gain our peace, have sent to peace, than on the torture of the mind to lie in restless ecstasy, meaning frenzy, agitated madness. Duncan is in his grave. After life's fitful fever he sleeps well. Treason has done his worst. Nor steel, nor poison, malice domestic, foreign levy, nothing can touch him further. This suggests that envy is the condition of soul Macbeth has chosen. The envy of the demonic Iago of Othello 
is here incarnated in one who has reached the top of the human hierarchy. But being a sin in the will, envy cannot be assuaged by any external gains, even of kingship, any more than mere physical water without penitence can clear the conscience of Lady Macbeth. Key line 9. In Act 3, Scene 4, the banquet scene, it is noteworthy that once again, as I mentioned earlier, Macbeth gets exactly what he calls for. The ghost of Banquo takes literally what Macbeth says hypocritically. When Macbeth pretends to flatter the murdered Banquo publicly by saying, Our country's honor would be roofed, meaning present under the roof of this house, if only Banquo were present, lines 39 to 40, Banquo's ghost appears. When Macbeth says, would he were here, line 90, the ghost appears again. When Macbeth cries, hence, lines 105 to 106, the ghost departs. This ironical obedience of the ghost to Macbeth's commands dramatizes the hypocritical divorce between Macbeth's words and his will, while illustrating most terrifyingly that though reality gives Macbeth everything he wants, as I said earlier, it turns out not to be what, at Act 1, Scene 4, Line 51, he imagined his black and deep desires would yield. Again, it is the nature of reality that success achieved through evil cannot be enjoyed. Now here are 13 specific notes to help you in your reading. Note 1. In Macbeth's soliloquy at Act 1, Scene 3, Lines 134 to 142, several words need clarification. In the lines, That suggestion whose horrid image doth unfix my hair, suggestion means temptation. The image of his being king, suggested by the weird sisters, in Macbeth's mind becomes the temptation to kill Duncan in order to make the prediction come true. The horrid image is the image of killing the king, which throws Macbeth's body into terrified chaos, hair standing on end, heart knocking at ribs, against the use, meaning the normal condition, of nature. To this extent, Macbeth is simply human, horrified by what would and ought to horrify anyone. Present fears are less than horrible imaginings means that the killing of Duncan which is at this point only fantastical, that is, merely imaginary, not yet realized, frightens him more than the actual dangers of the battlefield from which he has just come. The normal functioning of his body is smothered under the surmise that is his image of killing the king, and nothing is but what is not means nothing is real to him except what is not real yet. In short, the killing he imagines doing is more real and more terrifying to him than any killing he has actually done. Note 2. I discussed in detail Lady Macbeth's serpent speech at Act 1, Scene 5, Line 60 to 70, in the section called Sound and Sense, in my podcast Session 3 of Chapter 1 in Series 1, where I pointed out the composite experience Shakespeare gives us of the image of the serpent the idea of Satan, the ambitious desire for solely sovereign sway and masterdom, and the sound of hissing. Note 3. In Act 1, Scene 7, Line 7, in the phrase, we'd jump the life to come, the word jump means risk. Macbeth says that he would be willing to risk eternal damnation if he could be sure that here, upon this bank and shoal of time, meaning on this side of death, he could avoid the bad consequences of the evil act he is contemplating. Note 4. Act 1, Scene 7, Lines 25-28 to 28 presents a challenging condensation of metaphors. Macbeth concludes his soliloquy with this. I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition, which o'erleaps itself, and falls on the other. Let's try to parse it out. A rider wears spurs on his boots with which to prick the sides of a horse 
to make it leap a stream or barrier. Here the horse is Macbeth's intention to become king by killing the king, and the spur is his ambition. Vaulting ambition might mean that Macbeth has an ambition to vault from his present position into the kingship, or it might mean that his ambition itself is vaulting, that is, overreaching, or it might mean both at once. The ambition then or leaps itself and falls on the other. Many editors gloss this as the image of either a rider who leaps too forcefully onto the saddle and falls on the other side of the horse, or a horse that leaps too soon, too high, or too far, and falls on the other side of the barrier. The image of the spur in line 25 gives weight to the latter image, but the word side, which some editors insert, making and falls on the other side, does not appear in the text. What can fall on the other mean without the word side, which is a pure editorial conjecture? The answer lies in another meaning of the phrase to fall on, namely to attack. In this sense, the ambition or leaps itself, that is, goes beyond its proper limit, as in Shakespeare it is the essence of ambition to do, and literally falls on in the sense of attacks the other, that is, Duncan. But to this literal sense should be added the metaphysical idea that by falling on the king, in the sense of attacking and killing him, Macbeth will also fall from the pinnacle of fortune, his own kingship, into defeat and death, and from the pinnacle of grace into sin and thence into hell. The image of falling on the other thus unites the physical attack on the king, the collapse of the ambition itself, and the fall into damnation, embodying in a single phrase the union of free will choice, physical action, and spiritual consequence. Note 5. At Act 1, Scene 7, Line 60, Lady Macbeth says, But screw your courage to the sticking place. But here means only or just. Just screw your courage to the sticking place. The words screw and sticking place are metaphors alluding to the crossbow, some models of which were cocked with a screw mechanism like a windlass. The sticking place is the point on the shaft of the crossbow at which the string, when screwed to its limit, was hooked to the trigger. The metaphor gains force from the fact that at various times during the Middle Ages, the use of the crossbow was banned by the church and by some kings, and from the fact that though less efficient than a longbowman, two shots per minute for the crossbow versus twenty shots per minute for the longbow, a crossbowman required far less training and was therefore afforded far less honor, though it took courage to man a crossbow during battle because of the time required to reload it. Hence, Lady Macbeth uses the image of a fierce weapon in the hands of a lower-ranking and possibly dishonorable soldier whose courage is essential to wielding that instrument of death. Note 6. At Act 3, Scene 1, Line 67 to 69, Macbeth repines that he has mine eternal jewel given to the common enemy of man to make them kings, the seeds of Banquo kings. The common enemy of man refers to Satan, and mine eternal jewel means his own immortal soul. Note 7. The third murderer in Act 3, Scene 3 is sometimes said to be Macbeth himself but there is no evidence for this supposition. There is also no explicit indication that he is the devil. However, because of the significance of the number three in this play, three witches, three early prophecies, three later prophecies, three entrance into the porter's imaginary hell, and so on, we may suppose that the addition of a third murderer gives the murderers a supernatural dimension. The third murderer is the one who asks, who did strike out the light, and there's but one down, the sun is fled, recalling the limitation on the forces of darkness implied by the first witch at Act 1, Scene 3, lines 24 to 25, that I discussed earlier in Key Line 1, though his bark cannot be lost, 
yet it shall be tempest-tossed. Compare this mysterious third murderer to Macbeth's calling out to Seton in Act 5, Scene 3, line 19 to 20, which I'll discuss in a moment in specific note 12. Note 8. All of Act 3, Scene 5, and lines 39 to 43 and lines 125 to 132 of Act 4, Scene 1, along with the songs included there in some editions, are spurious. They are not written by Shakespeare, and their inclusion distracts from the integrity of the play. Except by textual scholars, they should be ignored. I will discuss these spurious additions in the podcast of Chapter 14 in Series 1 on hypothetical, spurious, and falsely attributed plays and passages in Shakespeare. Note 9. At Act 3, Scene 6, lines 1 through 20, Lennox must be understood to be criticizing Macbeth with veiled but bitter sarcasm. In Macbeth's Scotland, speaking directly can be fatal. Note 10. In Act 4, Scene 3, it must be understood that Malcolm's self-accusations are fabrications to test the loyalty of Macduff. In the podcast called The World, the Flesh, and the Devil, in his series Sheltering with Shakespeare, dramaturge Dakin Matthews astutely observes that Malcolm accuses himself in increasing degrees of evil, first of lust, that is, a sin of the body or of the vegetable soul, lines 60 to 65, then of avarice, that is, a sin of the heart or the sensible soul, lines 78 to 84, and lastly of malice, that is, a sin of the mind, or the intelligible soul, the sin of Satan, lines 91 to 100. If Macduff were to support the claim to the throne of one as evil as Malcolm makes himself out to be, it would signify that Macduff did not care about Scotland, but only about tricking Malcolm into returning to be killed as Macbeth would desire. When Macduff rejects such a king as Malcolm paints himself to be, lines 102 to 114, Malcolm realizes that Macduff's loyalty is genuine. Malcolm has learned from painful experience the art to find the mind's construction in the face that his father had once innocently but fatally claimed not to exist. I discussed this a little earlier in Key Line 4. Note 11. At Act 4, Scene 3, Lines 146 to 159, Malcolm reports that the touch of Edward the Confessor the English king, cures the disease called the king's evil. That disease is now called scrofula. The healing touch was a heavenly gift supposedly passed down to every succeeding king of England, including James I, who was king when this play was written. The report emphasizes that the king is full of grace, line 159, which implies that his military support of Malcolm's claim to the throne of Scotland has the blessing of heaven. Note 12. In Act 5, Scene 3, Lines 19 to 20, Macbeth calls out for a follower named S-E-Y-T-O-N. The pronunciation guides tell us that the name is probably to be pronounced Seton. But Shakespeare must have intended the audience to hear it as very close to, if not identical with, Satan. It is possible that in Renaissance English, the diphthong E-Y and the long A may have been almost indistinguishable. In any case, the implication is that the character and his name exist to cause us to hear Macbeth calling for the attendance and assistance not of God, but of the devil. Note 13. At Act 5, Scene 7, Line 10, young Seward says to Macbeth, Thou liest claiming not to find Macbeth's name fearful, though he finds it hateful. Young Seward's bravery is confirmed at Act 5, Scene 9, Lines 12 to 13, when Seward asks whether his son had his hurts before, that is, were his wounds on the front or on the back of his body. Ross answers, I, on the front, meaning young Seward died bravely, facing Macbeth, not running away. I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare.